the following organizations have provided funding for this Into the Outdoors television series. Climate change is an issue that affects us all. But did you know that countries and communities, big industries and local businesses, scientists and educators, people all around the world are working together to develop solutions to tackle climate change? And you can help. In fact, there are many ways that you and your family can make a difference. Together, we make a bigger impact. We can find the best path to solve this crisis. In this episode, we focus on solutions to the climate crisis. These are the offices of Slipstream, an organization whose mission is accelerating climate solutions for everyone. Diana and Greg both work with people and companies to help them make choices to ensure a cleaner future. What exactly do you mean by accelerating climate solutions for everyone? For me, accelerating climate solutions means marrying energy efficiency with clean energy resources and making sure that people today have the information to make informed decisions. Just what is causing the planet to heat up? Well, increasingly, it's carbon emissions in the atmosphere. And these carbon emissions are known with other greenhouse gases to trap the sun's solar rays, heating up the planet and causing the climate to change. I know burning fossil fuels is part of the problem, like automobile exhaust. Yes, that's true. And that's a great example of a solution that we've already developed, like these electric vehicles here. But it's not just cars. It's not just transportation. There's agriculture, there's shipping, there's the built environment. And by that, I mean the houses and the places we live and work. We have a lot of solutions from reducing energy use through energy efficiency to marrying that with clean energy resources. Clean energy is clean, renewable power that doesn't generate carbon or waste. For example, the solar panels, hydroelectric power, wind turbines, and many more. I've heard of decarbonization. What exactly does that mean? So decarbonization is reducing the amount of carbon that's put into the atmosphere. And we can do that by cutting emissions or increasing carbon sinks and protecting the forest in those areas that actually absorb carbon from the atmosphere. A lot of companies, a lot of countries have goals to reduce their carbon emissions to zero by 2050. What are some climate solutions that already exist? Well, first and foremost, it's investing in solar energy. The photovoltaic panels that you see on the building here, increasingly investing in that because that is allowing us to provide clean energy to the grid. What exactly can I do? Well, the first thing you can do is simply use less energy. Turn lights off when you leave rooms and also make sure that your video game systems are turned off when you're done with them. Check and see if your local utility company offers an energy efficiency kit that'll help you save energy at home with simple improvements that you can do yourself. We can encourage everyone to use clean, energy-efficient technologies like LED light bulbs, faucet aerators, high-efficiency shower heads, Energy Star appliances, electric lawnmowers that are quieter and less disruptive to the neighborhood, and many more. Let's talk about making bigger impacts. Did you know that we've developed more efficient ways to heat and cool our homes and buildings? Just like we've made significant improvements to make automobiles so that they rely less and less on fossil fuels and even run on clean electricity, we're making big improvements in how we are heating and cooling homes. The climate solution we're talking about is called a heat pump. You could think about them as the engine of your home. This is a centrally ducted air source heat pump. It's capable of heating our homes and cooling our homes. This replaces our furnace that runs off natural gas, propane, or fuel oil. What are the benefits of using air source heat pumps? Well, for one, air source heat pumps provide better comfort inside our homes. But when it's heating, it doesn't burn any fossil fuels on site. That means that the environment around the home is cleaner and safer. Are there any cost benefits? When we're cooling with these, these units are much more efficient and they cost less to operate. How does this offset fuel emissions? Fuel emissions are generated when we burn fossil fuels. This system runs on electricity and as we clean the electric grid with renewable resources like solar and wind energy, this unit doesn't really generate any emissions because we're not burning any fossil fuels. 
Is it difficult to replace my old system with a heat pump? Actually, no, it's as easy as changing out your air conditioner and furnace. Wow, I didn't even know this existed. Wouldn't it be great if all homes and buildings could use carbon-free technology? Yes, that would make a significant impact. It's important to make the right choices now to eliminate our need for fossil fuels and reduce CO2 emissions. Let's go check out another air source heat pump. You notice this looks a little different than what we saw before. Yeah, it does. This is an example of the outdoor unit for what we call a ductless air source heat pump. And these are really great when you're doing an addition or you're in an existing home and it's hard to get existing ductwork to where you need it. Can you tell me why these units are better than other heating and cooling systems? First of all, it's much easier to move heat than it is to make heat. Just like a air conditioner or a refrigerator, these use what's called a refrigerant. And it's that refrigeration cycle where you evaporate the refrigerant that draws energy from the environment, cooling the environment. Or when that refrigerant condenses into a liquid, it releases energy into the environment, heating the environment. And these units are up to 300% efficient. So for every unit of energy we put in, we can get three times that out in terms of usable heating or cooling for the house. So that's the first thing, very, very energy efficient. The second thing is they're safer, okay? With no combustion inside the house, we have no problem with carbon monoxide or particulates in the air, which we know can impact human health. This is the indoor unit that's paired to the outdoor unit we saw outside. And this is called a ceiling cassette. And the air is drawn up through the center, and then depending on whether we're heating or cooling, the air is heated and distributed out the four sides. So how does this make a cleaner environment inside the home? Well, it has a, a filter built into it. And then, you know, these things run more continuously at low speed to provide even heating and cooling. And when we're doing that, we're continually filtering the air. So that's gonna help with particulates and dust. The other thing is that continuous low runtime helps dehumidify the air, controlling the moisture in the air, making us more comfortable. And again, more healthy indoor environment. Wow, I never knew about heat pumps. Thank you so much for sharing this new technology with me. Well, absolutely no problem, Zach. We really appreciate the time we spent together. And I want to remind you that the decisions we make today are going to have big impacts in the future. And again, that future is pretty bright. Now that we know how to make our homes more energy efficient, let's focus on the way we get from place to place. Yep, I'm talking about cars. If you're like me, you might have or be close to getting your license, and this opens up a whole new realm of responsibility when it comes to lowering your carbon footprint. But what is a carbon footprint? A carbon footprint is the amount of carbon emissions we contribute to the atmosphere as an individual. We contribute to carbon emissions through things like the food we eat, the energy we consume, and our transportation habits. So what can you do to lower your carbon footprint when it comes to transportation? You could walk, run, or even bike. But you can't avoid cars forever. Eventually, you're gonna need to go somewhere that's a little too far for your bike. Whew. So what then? That's where electric vehicles, or EVs, have been making a huge impact in the transportation game. But what is an electric vehicle, and what makes them more eco-friendly? Let's meet up with the experts to find out. Hey Tim. Hi Aubrey. Thanks for meeting up with me today. I've got a few questions I hope you could answer about EVs. Absolutely. What can I answer for you? Well first off, what is an electric vehicle and what makes them better for the environment? Very simply, an electric vehicle is a vehicle that uses a combination of electricity, a battery, and an electric motor to power and move that vehicle. This is different than what we'd say a traditional vehicle is that uses a petroleum product like diesel or gasoline. The primary reason EVs are considered better for the environment is they don't require burning fossil fuels, which then produce emissions. But what are fossil fuels? I mean, based on what we've learned so far, they don't exactly sound like a good thing. Why is that? Well, fossil fuels are natural energy resources, but fossil fuels aren't renewable, meaning once we utilize this resource, there's no way to replenish it. In order to create usable energy from fossil fuels, we need to burn that resource 
And one of the byproducts from burning that resource is carbon dioxide or CO2 emissions. And even though carbon dioxide, it is natural in the atmosphere, the problem comes when there's too much in the atmosphere. And through climate science, we know that carbon dioxide traps heat in the atmosphere, and that can significantly impact the environment in which we live. And according to the US EPA, about 27% of all greenhouse gas emissions are generated within the transportation sector. So traditional cars run on gasoline, which is a fossil fuel, to create energy to power their engines in order to drive. But EVs, on the other hand, they run on electricity. What makes that better? EVs are better for the environment because they do not rely on fossil fuels. Since they don't rely on fossil fuels, they have zero tailpipe emissions. Okay, so how do you fill up your car then? Here, let me show you. Well, Aubrey, this is what we call an EV charging station. And one of the really unique things about these charging stations is they can be installed anywhere electricity is currently available. So this could be where you currently get fuel for your traditional type vehicle, or it could be at your workplace, or at school, or even right in the convenience of your own home. And very simply, when we charge them, we take the adapter and just plug that right into the vehicle. Hold on. Just because the EV itself isn't still burning fossil fuels doesn't mean it's not still using them. Do you know what I'm talking about? The energy in our household is often fueled by non-renewable resources like fossil fuels. So for an EV to be truly green, the energy in your house also needs to be green. How can we make sure that the EVs are truly green? Well, Aubrey, that's a really good catch. What you're talking about is the generation mix, and that's all of the different fuels that go into generating electricity, like wind, solar, or hydroelectric. And that generation mix is gonna change not only locally, but regionally. The electricity on the electrical grid is increasingly becoming cleaner and cleaner. And this is because utilities like XL Energy are setting aggressive goals to produce carbon-free electricity by 2050. So where we're standing today, right here in Northwestern Wisconsin, about 60% of the energy generated is from a carbon-free resource. 30% of that is from a renewable resource, but it's really easy to get 100% renewable energy right in your home. By working with your utility and participating in programs like XL Energy's Renewable Connect program, you can get renewable energy delivered right to your doorstep. So by switching to 100% renewable energy, you can feel good about reducing your carbon footprint at home and on the go. Seems like a pretty simple change that makes a huge impact on the environment. But what about the car itself? Can you tell the difference between an EV and a traditional car when you're out on the road? I'll let you be the judge of that. Let's go for a spin. So would you be able to point out any electric vehicles on the road? Well, it's not always easy to spot an EV when you're driving because they do look very similar to a traditional vehicle or other vehicles that are on the road. Electric vehicles are used across many different sectors. They're not just commuter cars. We actually see those in industries like fire trucks, delivery trucks, or school buses, or even electric bucket trucks. EV technology is becoming more and more adaptable across many industries. And many industries are adopting EVs due to the cost savings and environmental benefits associated with EVs. That's really cool. I mean, I never realized how many different types of EVs were out on the road. It's cool to see the community implementing EVs, but what about me? Is an EV an affordable alternative to traditional cars? Well, an EV can be a great option for a lot of people, but not everyone has the same type of access. If you don't have a lot of charging infrastructure in your community, one way you can help is by working with your local governments and community leaders to make investments in charging infrastructure. And that can help provide access and equity to everybody. So not only are EVs better for the environment because they don't contribute to CO2 emissions, they also can be an easy and affordable alternative. Seems like the biggest difference in switching is the difference you'll be making on the environment. You got it, Aubrey. And I hope I answered all your questions today. Now, when you go and get your next car, I hope you consider an EV. Yeah, I've been saving up for my first car, and what do you say I give the EV a test drive this time? Absolutely. 
so now you can ride in style while also caring for your planet. Because remember, green is cool. Okay, so now that we know how we can be sustainable at home and on the go, it's time to take a deeper look at where our energy is coming from. Aubrey made a really good point. Some energy is sourced more sustainably than others. But what does that mean? That's why I'm here at Badger Hollow Solar Farm to learn more about where our energy comes from and how it gets to where it's needed. Hi, Alyssa. Oh, hi, Chloe. Alyssa works for the American Transmission Company, or ATC. She'll be able to tell us a little more about what happens here. Thanks for meeting up with me. Can you tell me about what happens here at Badger Hollow? Sure. Well, as you can see, we're at the Badger Hollow Solar Farm, which is located in Iowa County in southwest Wisconsin. And a solar farm is not unlike a typical agricultural field. It's similar, though, in the fact that actually we're farming the sun. Once this solar farm is at full capacity, it will have the ability to output 300 megawatts of solar energy. That's enough to power about 45,000 homes. So how does energy get from the solar farm to our homes, schools, and businesses? Well, that's a really good question, Chloe. So think about when you're at home and you flip on the light switch in your room. You want that light to come on right away, right? That's where the high voltage electric transmission system comes in. Those poles and wires are in place so that the energy can travel long distances to places where they're needed. The way that it works is the sun is absorbed into the panels creating energy, and then that energy moves underground through dedicated wires to that collector station. Once it's in the collector station, that energy is stepped up into high voltage electric energy, in this case, 138,000 volts. It exits the collector station through the dedicated wires and travels north from here to a substation where that energy can then access the rest of the grid. In fact, would you like to go check out one of our substations right now? Of course. Let's go. So Chloe, it's important to remember the three components of the power system, which include generation, transmission, like what we see here, and distribution. So the generation, much like what we saw at the Badger Hollow solar farm, that was obviously solar energy, but there's other forms of energy too. There's gas, wind, traditional coal-fired, hydro, and others. Our energy landscape is changing. And part of the reason that it's changing is because there are businesses and utilities and other organizations that are setting carbon reduction goals. And what that's doing is creating an impact on the existing generation system. So we're seeing traditional baseload coal-fired power plants uh, retiring or scheduled to be retired, and that energy has to be replaced with something. An important part of ATC and the electric transmission system is that we provide a pathway of power for those renewable generation sources. And it's why we play such a vital link as we make this energy transition into the future. So I guess these transmission lines are pretty important, but obviously this can't all happen on its own. It takes a whole team of people to make sure that energy is making it to our homes and communities. But who are they, and what do they do? Let's meet with another member of ATC to find out. Bye, Alyssa. Thank you. Bye, Chloe. I'm here with Joey Chang, a transmission planner at ATC. So Joey, what exactly is a transmission planner? A transmission planner's role is to analyze the present and future need of the electrical grid. We study system models to determine the best solution to help the industry transform from the traditional generation to the clean renewable resource, energy storage, and other type of emerging technologies. We also collaborate with all our interconnection customer and the cross-functional team at ATC to optimize the reliability and efficiency of the transmission system. That sounds like pretty important work. How could someone like me get started in a career in energy? 
If you are interested in a career in energy, make sure to get involved in any STEM-related classes to gain knowledge and experience. Majority of our transmission planner has an electrical engineering background. However, we collaborate with so many different disciplines in order to have a successful project. For example, civil engineering, environmental science, computer science, legal and other related business degrees, to name just a few. Also, stay curious on what's going on in the energy industry and develop a learning desire on new technologies. Thank you, Joey. It sure has been electrifying learning about energy with you today. Now it's time for me to follow the transmission lines back home. Thank you, Chloe. Bye. Thank you. Transmission lines are a vital and efficient way to transfer energy from where it's generated to where it's needed. But this isn't the only way to transfer energy to your homes, schools, and businesses. Let's check out what Charlie's up to. So we've seen how to lower your carbon footprint in a variety of different ways. But what about eliminating it altogether? Intrigued yet? I'm here at Forest Edge Elementary School, Wisconsin's first net zero school. But what does that mean? Net zero refers to the goal of offsetting the release of greenhouse gas emissions by producing more clean energy than is used. So what does that look like at a school? Thankfully, Andy Weiland is here to explain what makes Forest Edge unique. What's really cool about Forest Edge Elementary is it produces as much energy as it needs throughout the year. And then what we do is we make sure that the building is super efficient so that when we produce that energy, we're using it the best way that we can. We do that by having really good insulation of our windows and our walls, but also by using geothermal uh, energy um, in the ground to basically heat and cool the building. So we have 99 geothermal wells uh, underneath our playground, actually, that go down 406 feet into the ground. And we use the energy of the earth, um, kind of the energy that's basically uh, very um, constant in the earth, to heat and cool the building. We move heat either into the building or out of the building, depending on the season. Um, we do those things to keep uh, the building as efficient as possible. Why did the district choose to build a net zero school? Our school board has been um, really looking at different things within society and trying to take positions on them. And a number of years ago, they studied climate change and came up with some directives for the district to basically um, find solutions to those issues. And one of the things that we thought we could do was to build a net zero school so that um, we weren't producing any carbon and then use it as kind of a demonstration for our students so that they understood that there were solutions that we could do to help combat climate change. That's a really big goal. So what kind of technology is required to make this net zero go possible? So we have 1,704 solar panels on top of the building. And those are the um, panels that generate the energy for the entire building. Well, here, let me show you. So we actually have solar panels right over here. So the panels basically use different materials within the panel to move electrons around. And those electrons then basically create the current that we use in the building. They're on all the roofs, and really what was really important when we built the building is not to shadow any of those panels because we want them to always have sun when the sun's shining like today. So what makes a net zero school's energy use different from a typical school? That's a great question. So obviously we're not producing carbon and putting it into the atmosphere, but we're also run the building a lot less expensive than our other buildings. This building runs less than half the cost of our other buildings as far as um, the energy that it purchases. So there are lots of different technologies that the building uses. Um, one of them is what's called sage glass, which basically reduces the amount of heat energy that comes in from the outside and keeps the building cooler during the summer. It basically tints the windows so that it keeps the glare and the energy out of the building. We also have an advanced lighting control system that measures the amount of light that's underneath the space and then adjusts the lighting levels, uh, therefore reducing the amount of energy if there's natural light coming into the building. So what happens when the solar panels capture more energy than the school needs? So sometimes we send the energy to the grid and help the neighborhood next door here. But other times, basically we store that energy in a large battery that we have. And that battery basically then allows us to run the building when the sun's not shining. So the grid is basically a system that's set up by utility companies to bring or deliver energy to our homes and businesses. As the grid becomes more green, all of our buildings become more green. And so that's why it's really important to electrify our buildings and our transportation system because then we're putting less carbon into the, into the air. 
That sounds like a great way to lower the carbon footprint of an entire community. So we've seen the benefits of the community and the environment of having a net zero school, but what about the students that actually go here? Our students are so lucky because our teachers are engaged in the process of creating lessons about energy, whether it's solar energy, geothermal energy, heat, uh, wind, anything at all. Our kids are learning hands-on through our building, through our experiences, and through our design. And we're really looking at the net zero prospect of how our kids can learn about it as young children and carry it up through adulthood. So what makes these opportunities so unique? We really looked at how kids learn and what we want them to know by the end of their time here at Forest Edge. So the lessons at kindergarten are really quite simple and talk about the sun and solar energy. As we get older, we really have kids explore geothermal energy and understanding how that works and how it benefits our environment. We have different places throughout the building where we have interactive TVs that they can use the touch screen to learn about our energy use. So we're trying to make it realistic for our kids to see that they do have an impact on our planet by doing simple things such as turning off the lights, lowering the heat, and really looking at how our building supports that kind of learning. So what's it like working at the first net zero school in Wisconsin? Wow, it's been great. It's been great to see the energy in the kids and have a lot of our staff members excited to be here because they see the benefits of teaching our kids at a young age to take care of our planet. It's been so great to be a pioneer in this work. We've had schools across the state and across the Midwest visit us because they want to implement similar designs in their building because they see the benefits for the future. I would love to see more net zero schools in our communities. You bet, Charlie, I would too. What's really exciting is to see what our kids and other kids can take into the future with more buildings designed like this. As individuals, we can start by taking small steps towards reducing our carbon footprints. But think about the huge steps we can take as a community to lower our greenhouse gas emissions. Forest Edge Elementary School is a great example of how a community of people came together to fight against climate change. How are you joining the fight? We learned about a lot of great ways to lower your carbon footprint. So consider trying one of those at home or the next time you head into the outdoors. The following organizations have provided funding for this Into the Outdoors television series.